thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking about targeting stem cell signals um, in therapy-resistant cancers uh, in solid and hemalignancies. Um, and I'll just start sort of generally with the idea that um, we have for um, many years now been interested in how pre-malignant lesions uh, with additional mutations uh, become malignant. And one of the things um, that we've worked on is not as much proliferation or cell death, which are actually aberrant in both states, uh, but the fact that there's a state change that occurs when pre-malignant lesions become malignant uh, and they undergo a differentiation arrest and are unable to differentiate further. So if you think about development where normally you go from being immature to being mature, in this case, it's as if these mutations are really unraveling uh, all the programs that were put in place during development um, so that these cells become more immature collectively. So you can think of this sort of in development in reverse. So in thinking of this as development in reverse, one of the things that we've done in context of trying to understand this is look at stem cell signals, which as you know, are high early in development and they fade or are extinguished with differentiation. And we and many other labs have shown that in cancer, uh, as pre-malignant lesions can be fairly low in the stem cell programs, uh, but these are elevated or hijacked and activated as the cancer becomes more aggressive. So the idea of studying this really long term is that if we understood the signals that are turned on to drive this pre-malignant lesion to a full-on malignancy, those may be used as a molecular basis for enabling early detection. And if we knew the signals that are needed to take this pre-malignant lesion to a full-on malignancy, it may be a strategy for early interception. And many of the pathways and drugs that uh, as a community we have discovered uh, could be very well be effective or more effective early on. And one of the challenges has been really that we use a lot of these drugs or uh, interception of these programs too late um, in disease. So in uh, looking at stem cell programs, uh, one of the pathways that we've been very interested in is an RNA binding protein called Masashi. And this was originally um, identified at Hopkins as an RNA binding protein in, uh, during Drosophila development. And when it's mutated or uh, there's a loss of function created, uh, instead of one bristle and a neuron, these flies get two bristles. And because of its double bristle phenotype, it was um, named Musashi after this iconic Japanese samurai who used to fight with two swords. And we had found several years ago that Musashi was actually very low in chronic phase disease and that it rose as disease became more and more aggressive in chronic myeloid leukemia, stepping through accelerated phase into blast crisis. So um, we had done work showing that if you block Musashi either through shRNA delivery or uh, through a genetic uh, allele, uh, you can gain in survival in these models and in, in leukemia growth, and also that patient samples that were in blast crisis would respond to blockade in Musashi. So one of the things that we'd noticed at the end of that work was that Musashi was in fact not just high in hemalignancies, but also in a lot of solid cancers. And this included aggressive cancers like GBM, high-grade breast cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer, but no one really knew what its role was. Um, so we started to work with Andy Lowy, who's a pancreatic surgeon, on pancreas cancer, uh, which as you know, uh, is a lethal and deadly disease uh, with very few options currently and much in need of a sort of altered clinical landscape. So we studied this to understand um, whether Musashi and other stem cell programs may be relevant in pancreas cancer progression, uh, partly because of if you look at how pancreas cancer progresses, it goes from being highly differentiated, although dysplastic, into a more malignant adenocarcinoma, which is fairly undifferentiated. Um, and so we took a model of pancreatic cancer called the KPC, where the RAS and P53 alleles were mutated. Um, and in this model, there's a very uh, large tumor that develops in a few weeks. And when you delete Musashi in this, you get 
a much smaller tumor. But what the important thing is, actually, it's not just a smaller tumor, it's more benign, because if you look at a cross-section of the wild type versus the knockout, the wild type is all sheets of adenocarcinoma, whereas the knockout still has regions of normal tissue left, and whatever aberrant tissues are arising are, in fact, all pan in. So while the wild type has all adenocarcinoma, the knockout has uh, mostly pan in lesions and no adenocarcinoma, suggesting that these stem cell programs are really critical for powerful mediators like RAS and P53 to take a pre-malignant lesion into a full-on malignancy. So we've also developed uh, reporters to understand how these uh, massage positive cells contribute to disease. So these are knocked in so that cells that are positive for massage uh, are lit up in green or yellow. So this is uh, GFP or YFP. Um, and you can see that it lights up stem cells, but does not is not active in differentiated cells. And in the brain, for example, it lights up the hippocampus and SVZ domain, which are enriched for stem and progenitor cells and it's silent in most of the rest of the mature brain. Uh, so what we've done is cross this to the KPC model, again, the pancreatic cancer model, to really highlight the heterogeneity of the cells there. Um, so this shows you that you can, although everything is RAS and P53 mutated, uh, the GFP positive cells and GFP negative cells are pretty clear, uh, and the GFP negative cells are predominantly what the tumor is made of, but the GFP positive cells are a small subset of cells that carry a stem cell program. Now, although they're a minority, in reality, they're more aggressive. So if you take the Masashi report positive and the negative, the report positive makes organoids, the report negative doesn't, and the report of positive cells really drive all of the lethality and the reporter negative cells don't. Um, and finally, if you treat with standard of care chemotherapy like gemcitabine, uh, what you see is that the reporter positive, the stem cell part of the tumor is very small at the outset, but as you treat with the chemo, uh, the reporter negative cells are depleted, the reporter positive cells are, remain behind. So they're really more resistant to these drugs that are currently used clinically, and they are really the main composition of residual disease or drug-resistant disease. So this is a really a potentially powerful platform for identifying drug-resistant cancers. Um, so this is a visual, in fact, like a movie of uh, pancreatic tumors in the KPC model highlighting the stem cells within the cancer. A lot of the blue, and this is, imagine a large sheet, are all RAS B53 mutated, uh, but epigenetically there's a subset that's activated the stem cell program, and you can see that it's uh, spatially restricted um, and when you treat and and that this can be really a good model to identify new programs and pathways that might allow us to eliminate this population um, along with chemo which might be better at eliminating sort of the bulk of the tumor so we've also imaged uh, beyond solid cancers uh, leukemias and one of the things that we found in leukemias is uh, that this is uh, using live imaging to so non-invasive imaging to look inside the native microenvironment to understand how cancers grow. Um, this is just showing you a bone marrow, a view of the bone marrow in um, uh, in a living uh, animal. Uh, and you can see sort of the blood vessels lit up and the rest of the marrow lit up. Uh, in blue and the green are sort of the edges of the bone lit up with a reporter. Uh, but the important thing is that when we image leukemia cells, we don't actually find them, uh, I mean, they are motile to some extent, but largely also enmeshed within the marrow. So one of the reasons uh, we were doing this is really to understand how much leukemia cells may depend on the microenvironment. Um, and uh, what we found is that a lot of leukemic cells are actually enmeshed and interacting with stromal cells and cells of the microenvironment, suggesting that they may utilize uh, interactions with the microenvironment as dependencies. Um, so the reason I um, mentioned those is really because that led us to looking for Musashi targets. So we knew Musashi was important, but we were really looking for targets that might enable cells to interact with the microenvironment. So we did a screen looking for targets of Musashi uh, in both blast crisis CML and AML, and we looked at 
common genes that were downstream of Masashi because we knew this was critical, but we really wanted to uh, find other downstream target that could be actionable or could be inhibited uh, by new strategies. Um, so through this, um, we um, identified a molecule called tetraspanin-3, um, and this was downstream of Masashi in both uh, AML and blast crisis AML. It's a large family of four pass transmembrane proteins that can serve as a scaffolding protein and can associate with integrins, allowing a sort of involvement in cell adhesion and proliferation, but very little was really known about it uh, and none really known about it in cancer. Um, so what we did was we inhibited uh, the tetraspanin protein and showed that either through SHRNA or by building a knockout that we developed, you could really gain in survival. So this is survival curve. This is uh, how fast the control uh, mouse uh, die, the mice die of the tumor. Um, and if you inhibit tetraspanin, there's a very clear gain in survival. This is a mouse model. And if you look at patient samples, what you see is if you block it either with the control or you block it with tetraspanin, there's a very a dramatic reduction in growth of the leukemia when you block this program. So based on this, um, we have uh, launched a program really targeting tetraspanins um, in context of leukemia. And these antibodies have now been developed with the help of CIRM and are being vetted and tested in context of uh, both in vitro uh, inhibition of leukemic growth as well as in vivo inhibition. Um, and so just to summarize, um, what we've really found is that interactions with the local environment can really amplify the impact of intracellular and oncogenic signals on leukemia stem cells and disease propagation, and that targeting these programs like tetraspanin-3 that we've done with the help of CIRM may be more effective uh, as a sort of a combinatorial blockade of both niche signals that support these stem cells or these aberrant aggressive stem cells within cancers, as well as blocking intracellular events, and collectively they may be better able to control disease. Um, so this is just to thank all the people who did the work. So all of the work on uh, Musashi and tetraspanin and leukemia were carried out by Young Kwan and Javisha Bajaj, uh, and others involved in the leukemia side are uh, Kyle Spindler, Yutaka, and Mike Hamilton. And a lot of the testing um, that was done on these antibodies were done with Yutaka and Emily. Um, and I'd just like to also thank our collaborators, uh, Andy Lowy, uh, as well as Jeff Esko, Mark Ginsberg, Dan Van Hoff, um, and also thank CIRM for their support uh, of all of our work. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <music>